are ordered by God. That though they stumble, they are not utterly cast down because he sustains you with his hand that you are never, ever let down. today. We see you as big God. We see you as an unfailing God. We see you as a God who knows all, sees all, sits high and looks low, that does not sleep or slumber, whose arms are not short. And we say thank you, God, because you are invested in every intricate detail of our lives. Holy Spirit, we ask you to have your way in this place. We ask you to speak to us today, God. We ask you to deal with the issues of our heart, Father. We ask you to release a word in this place that strengthens our feet, Father, that teaches our hands to war, God, that keeps the praise in our mouth and our heart and courage. Release your, your joy in this place, God, because it is your joy that is our strength, and we give you all the glory. I ask you, Holy, Holy Spirit, for anointing that makes preaching easy that destroys yokes and lifts burdens. I ask you, God, for an effective and efficient word. Father, put an anointing on me for timeliness today so that we can respect the building and their schedule. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all know I gotta pray about it because I don't care about it most of the time. But I'm gonna try to be, I'm gonna try to be quick today. Because this rarely happens, but they have there is a there's a schedule for us to keep with this building today because someone else is coming in. But the Bible says that the word of God is quick. <laughs> and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. If you have your, uh, if you have your Bible today, we're going to be in Luke chapter 2. And I'm going to read you about 20 verses out of there from verse 9 or more than 20, 20, 27. And I had Ricky queued up. Hebrews chapter 4, but I think I'm going to hold that to the end. Because I'm, I don't know if y'all can handle that much Bible. <laughs> Luke chapter 2, I'm going to start at verse 9. And y'all just pray me through this, because uh, this ain't a standard Christmas message. Have we ever had a standard Christmas message in here? Well, then the pressure's off. Let's go. And lo, listen, and I'm this King James version today. If you're watching online, I'm normally new King James, but I had to go back to the, I had to go back to the to the root of a thing. I needed I needed the isseth. But you know, you know, <laughs> the funny thing is, you have to be careful what versions of scripture you do read, because there are some that are based on um, misinterpretations of the received text and there's words and things that are changed in this one in Hebrews chapter 4 which I'm not reading just to give you a kind of a point of what I'm talking about there's a Paul writes that if the day of peace had, uh, was related to Jesus is coming then God wouldn't have said this this that, and the other well and the other versions, even the New King James Version, it says Joshua, and Joshua's coming. Now we know that Jesus' name is Yeshua, right? Which translates Joshua, 
but unless you are aware of what the original scripture says and you are aware of that, then you would think you were talking about Joshua. So you got to be, so I had to go back to King James today. Says, and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Somebody say all people. That's you, that's me. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known to us. And they came with haste, found Mary and Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying, which was told to them concerning the child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. I love this, this uh, I'm not stopping there, but I just want to talk about that, how they stopped to talk about Jesus being circumcised on the eighth day. And when the day came for his circumcising, came his naming, um, and his placement, and all these things, and it connected back to what was said about him beforehand, because this is, this is how we should grow. That there is, there is a, a time of our, our birthing, and then there is a time where we grow, and there's a cutting away, and, and we begin to be more and more identified according to the promise and the word that God spoke on us. This is development. And we see this in, in the modern day movement. Let me say that. The modern spirit of the air doesn't want people to be circumcised. They want people to be castrated. And there is a difference between circumcision and castration. And the, the blaming of the making of eunuchs in ministry is often on how good the son or the daughter is. But every son ain't an Absalom. And every father ain't a David. Anyway, that's a different message. And when the days of purification, according to the law, I'm just listening. I got y'all. Don't worry. We're going. And when the days of, of her, excuse me, when the days of her purification, uh, according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Somebody say holy. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is uh, said in the law of the Lord a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons and behold there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon and the same man was just and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Ghost was upon him and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ and he came by the Spirit into the temple and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law. Then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, 
which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be, bro- uh, which shall be spoken against. Yes, sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. It's uh, crazy. We like to talk about the rising of our lives that Jesus causes and not the fall and then the rising. You may be seated. Don't worry, there's going to be more hope in this. I'm just setting some... There's just too much here to preach, so I'll be dropping little nuggets when I fill them for y'all. Somebody needed that. What we see here in the scripture, this, this particular scripture, is we got a declaration, we have a, we have a sign that's given, and then we have a promise that's released. It says this. It says, from the angels, they show up, and they are, the glory of God is shining around them, and they say that they, uh, I bring you good tidings of great joy. This is the declaration, which shall be for all people. For unto you this day a child is born in the city of David, our Savior, uh, Christ the Lord. So here's the declaration. This has just happened, right? Then there's a sign that's given. This is how you know this is happening. You're going to go, and in a manger, you're going to find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. When you see that, that's how you're going to know what we're saying is true, right? And then there's a promise that, that's released, um, and it says this. It says, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. Every, every declaration that is made by God has a promise or an end result that's attached to it. Whether that's a promise of, of, of blessing, a promise for God to pour something out, or a promise to whoop your tail. Every declaration of God has an end result attached to it, right? Every release uh, of God has indicators or signs. See, somebody can't amen that because, because they think God don't show them nothing. They walking through life blind with a spiritual cane tapping around in the things of the world, but the reality of it is every release of God has signs to it. They knew Jesus was coming because there was prophecy for years, thousands of years. They knew they knew that Jesus was there because they would find him in a manger. According to this, there was also a star that the Magi followed. That, and, and here's all of the signs that you can look at. We know we're in the end days because of the signs. We see the signs and Jesus actually rebukes the, the people of God for not being able to discern the signs. Right? And these signs are very clear indicators. Somebody say clear. clear. You don't have to guess with God. And this is what I love, is he's clear about what he says to us, and then he's clear about what he shows us. For people who wake up and make decisions about what God wants them to do based on what song came on the radio, and what time they arrived at work, and what someone said to them when they walked in the room, these are not signs, these are coincidences. These are, these are things that, that can be orchestrated by an enemy. An enemy can flatter you into making the wrong decision. An enemy can, can, can give you bad advice. You don't think that the enemy knows what you want? You know how he knows what you want? Not because, you, not because he can read your spirit or mind, but because that's all you talk about. I guarantee you that the people at your job could tell you more about what you want than they can tell you about your God. They can tell you more about the things you want to accomplish in life, the things you want to do this weekend, the places you want to go, the vacation you're taking. They can tell you your kid's age. They can tell you the grades they got, what you want them to get. But they can't tell you the address of your church. Well, Jesus... They can't tell you the dot com you want right now. So there's very clear indicators. I say all that because, because we follow false signs a lot of times. The Bible tells us that the invisible attributes of God are made known or made plain to man. So man is without excuse. You have no excuse not to know where God is moving. 
Now, the promise that's given in this situation here, this particular thing, is wrapped up in, in praise. And you might miss this promise if you don't realize that it's in the praise. Here's, here's, here's what I mean. What I'd said was a promise, which you guys may have missed it, was when, when Scripture said, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. Let me explain it to you. That's praise. Glory to God in the highest. And then look what's going to disseminate from that, right? Because God is so good. But here's, here's, here's the promise, though, is that Jesus was promised. The Messiah was promised. And when he hits the earth, here's what's declared. The same as what he declared when he hit the cross was it is finished. Here's what, he, what is declared by the angels when he hit the manger. It's finished. Glory to God in the highest. The most high, filled with glory, the third heavens, all the heavens sing his glory, but on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. See, at the end of this thing, because Jesus came, what's going to happen is, is the glory of God is going to fill the sky. There's going to be no need for no sun or no moon, according to the book of Revelation, right? Because he cracks the sky, and then the light that's behind the firmament is what shines, and it's day all the time, but on earth is going to be peace with goodwill towards men because of Christ. So what's being declared here is a promise and a prophecy uh, of what's coming. I think the way Hebrews 4 says it is, again, he limiteth a certain day. Saying to David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would, would he not afterward have spoken of another day? So the peace on earth that was announced right here is a prophesied promise of what's to come because of Jesus. See, you can't take little stuff like that and make it a Christmas slogan. And you can't breeze over that and say, oh, look, that's nothing that already happened because is there peace on earth or goodwill towards men? Scripture addresses it. If that had been the case, it'd be here. Right? But we miss it. And here's, here, here's what happens to us. Is, is it affects us. We miss God's promises because we don't realize that they are wrapped up in praise. We, we, we think that all of God's promises are supposed to nurture us in our hurt feelings. Or all of God's promises are supposed to make us feel better. But God's promises are wrapped up in praise. This right here we were reading and say, oh, the angels are just praising. No, God is just releasing his promise. And if we understood that, that his promise is wrapped up in praise, then we would put on a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. You see, see how that promise goes there? You, I promise you, you will not be depressed if you praise. Scripture says, scripture says that when David went up against Goliath, that, that, that he, he came at him with a rock, but he didn't declare the rock. He said, I don't come at you with sword. I don't come at you with chariot, horses. He said, I come at you in the name of the Lord of angel armies. And he starts giving God glory. Now, wrapped up in that praise is a dead giant. And wrapped up in that praise is a palace connected to an anointing. But people would miss it. Watch how people miss it. He goes up and he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Watch how this is praise. This is praise because he's saying our God has made a covenant with us. This has no covenant. Who is this? And so, so, so what's the response of his own brother? I know you're proud. Now you missed it because you ain't got no praise. You missed it because you don't know who our God is. Is there not a cause? Is there not an end result attached to what God has said? See, you get people in the Bible like Job's wife. She missed all of it. She missed all of it. She looks at him, she says, why don't you curse God and die? She didn't realize that if you just maintain your praise, and actually what she said to Job was, are you still going to maintain your integrity? Why don't you curse God and die? Are you still going to maintain your innocence? Absolutely. Because no matter how bad it is, what do you think? That it's only supposed to be good for us? God is God. This is Job's declaration. That if you maintain your praise, watch what comes out on the back end of it. So here's the process Mary walks through. She has to go through her 40 days of purification. This is what we read, right? Did 
This is what we read, right? Who church we in today? It don't sound like we in Square Root Church. Did somebody die yesterday? One of our church members died? Did anybody's mama die yesterday? Wake up. That's what the Bible say, right? Good, 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 good. So look, 40 days of purification. This is what happens. Now this process, and and I always defer to Phyllis whenever I start talking about uh, Israelite history or Jewish history because because she knows more than me. (laughs) So if I'm wrong, I see my man here today, if I'm wrong, get me right. So the 40-day purification process was because it was, a woman was considered ceremonial or ritually unclean after giving birth. They were considered this way because you are, you're opening the womb, but you are bringing in a, 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 a man or a woman, a, but, but mankind, that has sin already on them. Right? We're born into sin. So you're considered ritually unclean. So what happens here is if you had a young man, you had to go through the seven days of of, of, uh, whatever, and then you had 33 days to finish the bleeding or or go through the ritual outside and be considered unclean. If it was a young woman, you had 14 days of of the uh, post-birth and 66 days. It was twice as long if you had a girl. So, so she goes through her 40 days of purification, at, at which point, you know, she, she's separate. She's not in the house of God. When they circumcised Jesus and all this is all during this time, that's why it, was, it, it took so long for her to get to bring Jesus in, all right, to, to get him dedicated to the temple. When she comes into the temple as part of her uh, ceremonial, being ceremonial, unclean, and, and, but purificate, purifying herself, she comes in and she has two turtle doves as an offering. The offering was, one was for, usually for her, and they, if you were wealthy, you'd bring a lamb in, right? That lamb was a sin offering, okay? So if you were poor, you would come in with, they would, it would be acceptable to take two turtle doves. One, one as a burnt offering and one as a sin offering. Am I good so far? Okay, so this is why she's coming in and she's making these offerings. The Bible makes sure to let us know that Jesus was brought in after her purification process. Make sure to let us know this because just because it's Jesus don't mean she ain't got to get right. See, see, there's, there's a doctrine in the world today that say, oh, there's so much grace, you just do what you want to do, right? But the Bible makes it clear to us that just because you carry in Jesus don't mean you ain't got to be right. That you, and and, and here's, here's, how, here's how double clear they make it. She really didn't need to give the offering because Jesus was sinless. So she didn't need to give an offering for bringing sin-filled man into the world. Yet she did it anyway because while things were yet unknown about Jesus' birth and how he came about, she was so committed to obeying the law that she did it out of instinct even though she was exempt. Some of us want to see how, 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 how close we can get to that line without going over. Mary was trying to make sure she could stay as far away from that line as possible. How how far can I go without God being mad? No, no, no. How about you do the things you don't have to do to please him? How about we go over and above for God? Because God desires purity. Uh, He does. He does. He desires purity. And I know that's something that we have given up on in this generation. We got back seats laced with purity. Well, we got school hallways laced with purity. Spilled purity, right? We got, we, got, we got bedroom windows open up, sneaking in, people in and out to take our purity. And, they, and our kids only see it because we let them watch things that stream in impurity. We let them watch us as we stream in date after date of impurity. We don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't think that God cares about purity. But he didn't even give himself a pass. Because God don't, he don't care for the mixed. Somebody say, what's in the mix? He don't care. God don't deal with the mix. That's me and you. We like to mix a little bit of this with a little bit of that. 
a little bit of yesterday with a little bit of tomorrow. A little bit of, what's that song say? That ain't even the one. I was going a little more, a little bit of. How's it go? A little bit of Veronica. <laughs> a little bit of Monica in my life. A little bit of, right, right. See, that's more, more applicable. Y'all was doing something else. How's that? <laughs> Talking about purity. Y'all got to get the right soundtrack now. Ain't got the right soundtrack. We like to mix everything around. But the reality of it is God don't deal in mix. Watch this. Old Testament, the priest couldn't even deal with mixed fabrics. We're instructed through our scripture not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Uh, Revelation tells us that we ought to be hot or cold. That the mixture of the two, being lukewarm, gets you spit out. We're told that, that light has no fellowship with darkness. We're told that spring water and salt water don't flow from the same spring or blessings and curses from the same mouth. We're told to speak life or death. Choose you this day, life or death. I said before you, life or death. Choose life. Right? Jesus tells us beware of the leaven of the Pharisee. Don't even let their little bit mix in with what you're doing. Um, we're, we're told that we're like silver being purified, that when the dross comes to the top, the Lord don't stir it back in. He scoops it off because he don't deal in the mixture. Hence, we're not supposed to be conformed to the ways of this world. We like to mix it up. <laughs> um, scripture says in Genesis 11, 7 through 9, that God says, you know, he sees them building a tower. And he says that, he says they're one tongue, one people. Anything that they dream of doing, it won't be restrained from them. Let us go down and confound the tongue. Divide the tongue. Let us mix the tongue. Let us confuse the tongue. Because when you start dealing with mixture, you start dealing with confusing a thing. That is no longer what it was. It's no longer identifiable. Beat a couple eggs together and then see if you can identify which one is which. Right? So, so we, we got to stop offering God our, our mixed mess and we got to stop sending the world mixed messages because God is still into purity. Understand that we're supposed to repent from all sin, not our, not our less preferred sin. We're supposed to uh, uh, give all of our burden to him, not some of our burden. See, if some of us grab this, our life would be free because, because we like to carry the sin that so easily besets us. Carry our cares and wonder why it's so heavy in our life. Because he said, cast all your cares. Because he don't deal in the mixture. He don't say, give me some and you keep some. You carry those, I carry these. Oh, show sure it's heavy. We're supposed to seek him with our whole heart. We got to stop uh, bending over backwards to blend these clever cliches of ideology and philosophy and everybody got a good one-liner for Facebook. We got to quit trying to blend those, those clever sayings with, with, uh, with the compromises of our life, using them to justify where we don't keep God's word, right? We got to stop trying to mix worship with convenience. We got to stop mixing their indoctrination with God's doctrine. We got to stop mixing all of their ologies with theology. We listen, we, we, we say, well, I don't know if this is right about the Bible because so-and-so says this and they're a this and that ologist. They're a liologist. You understand that this world has invested in creating systems to deceive. Hence, the serpent deceived the whole world. Just because they call it the study of something does not mean that they know anything at all. Yeah. Studying a lie just makes you an expert in the lie. Yeah. We got to quit mixing his word with the Constitution. God ain't Republican. And he ain't Democrat. God ain't American. He ain't Libertarian. He ain't black or white. Somebody said, but Jesus' feet was like bronze. I ain't never met a bronze black man. I've seen bronze before, and it don't look like us. They said, oh, well, that's metaphorical, like his feet was in the oven. That's fine, except for when I read Ezekiel 1, and it describes the angels coming out of heaven and said that their bodies were shiny like, 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 uh, like bronze. 
And it gives a specific type of bronze. And if you look that up, guess what it don't look like? So we're going to deal with the celestial of God. Quit trying to put him in your skin. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We got to stop mixing God with the Constitution. You know the writers of the Constitution did not believe in our Jesus. For all of that, we are a Christian nation, founding fathers, nonsense. The pledge didn't have the words under God in it until the 1950s. Now that was added to deceive you. Thomas Jefferson had a Bible where he cut out all of the divinity of Jesus. The miraculous birth, the resurrection, every miracle, and took the moral parts, taped them together, made his own Bible because they believed in the morality, but they did not believe in the divinity, and that, that was part of their Freemason ritual. So, so, so you got to stop mixing their writings. And understand then that these things were written while we understand that, that we love the rights we get from them. These rights were given to us to include a mixture. The freedom of religion wasn't for you to be Christian. It was so witches could be witches. It was so, it was so Catholics at the time who were oppressing uh, the, the reformed or, or, or Protestant movement could come over unjudged by those who were fleeing them and then be placed into office so that they can give power back to their church. Y'all quote the Constitution about your rights there, but when the Bible says, forget not all his benefits, you can't name me the benefits package. We got to stop mixing his word with our emotions. We got to stop mixing his word with our desires. You do understand that what you feel don't change what's true. You do understand that, that what you want does not rewrite scripture. And the world can't tell then because of that mix if we are us or them. Uh, the church has told us for years, that don't be like the world. They can't tell the difference based on the clothes you wear or if you got lights in the church or it looks like a concert. We don't know if that's the world or the church. No, that ain't the problem. <laughs> the problem is everything else. The problem is you lose your brother at the voting booth. The problem is you lose your mind at the red light. The problem is you, you cuss out a waitress if she take too long or go off on a cashier if they give you the wrong change. The problem is you, the people who work what you see you. They don't ever see the lights in here to be talking about this. They can't tell if we us or them. Um, you know why they can't tell? Because we follow him from a distance. And we warm ourselves by their fire. And we deny that we was with him. And we change how we talk to fit into them. And we decide to walk under curses that we'll declare over ourselves rather than the blessings. If Peter can fall for it, we can fall for it. So she went through this purification process, right? And she took her 40 days uh, to where she did that. And she brought in her offering. And then we get to Jesus, right? Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. That's what this is all about. Jesus was the firstborn. And so, so, so it declares in Scripture that the firstborn uh, males are holy unto the Lord. Holy unto the Lord. If you're a firstborn male, let me see you. Firstborn males are holy unto the Lord. So, so, so here's... Here's how firstborns dealt within the culture of, of the Jewish people back then. Originally, the firstborn male of every Jewish family uh, was intended to serve as a priest in the temple in Jerusalem. This is, this is the original. Am I wrong? I, ain't, I know I ain't wrong. I'm just, I got my people with me. Uh, they, they was originally supposed to, to, to be in this role as a priest, but what happened was after the instance with the golden calf, where, where they defiled themselves and, and, and carried on like this, God offered a, a, a replacement for them. That the, then the sons of Aaron could step up and be a priest in place of your son. And you could redeem your son back to you by paying five shekels to the temple. 
so that you no longer had to release your son into service. And then the priests became um, Aaron's children, right? Could be redeemed for five shekels of silver. So here's the thing. When Jesus is brought into the temple, he's the firstborn son. Both, both of God, firstborn among the dead, right? First, first be, only begotten of God and Mary's first. So he's brought to the temple for dedication. And, and if you notice reading this, he never paid, or Mary and Joseph never paid the redemption cost. They never, Jesus, it was never paid to be, for him to be redeemed out of the cost of giving his life to the service of God. It was never paid, it was always prophesied that he would be priest, prophet, and king. We know per scripture that he is our high priest then. And then he takes our place as the priest so that we can be redeemed as sons and daughters. The work, the effective work of the cross was the same effective work of the birth because it was for this reason he came. Everything that touched Jesus touched this here. So not only that, but according to some people who, 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 who studied this history, um, that this, this is temporary, this replacement is temporary that this role is supposed to be given back to the first sons after the third temple, when Messiah comes. So here's what we know. We know the first temple was Solomon's temple, right? We know the second temple was destroyed in about 70 AD. But we know upon the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, when he ascended and sent the Holy Spirit, that we became the temple of the Holy Spirit. That there is a third temple that's raised up in us. His scripture says, you are kings and priests. Because now the responsibility of you, anointed, Holy Spirit-filled church, is that you are priests. That, that he bought you with a price and then put a responsibility on you as the body of Christ. Um, which is why then you will see in this world a threat, specifically on our male children. Because, because there's now, this, this, this is put back to us to be in this role as God's sons and daughters, um, to carry the priesthood. But this is why you see Pharaoh, what, what, when the children were two years and younger, kill all the, the firstborn men? Why you see Herod kill all the firstborn males, two years and under? Why you see our society going after our young men like never before, right? Whether they're in the streets, in the schools, being emasculated, feminized, whether it's in the medical field. So, so, so with the vaccine, you do know that the adverse effects that are, are being uh, hidden, specifically men between the age of 18 and 40, have the highest adverse effects of any group. Men ages 18 to 40, uh, take the biggest threat from the medicine. Now you tell me how a, 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 something that is medicinal has a target. You tell me how something that is supposed to help an individual does not help most people evenly. I understand everyone's body's different, but there is no way that it targets an age group and a sex. Firstborn son. He's our high priest. He made us priests in his image. Get this. Somebody say Rhema. Rhema. What is Rhema? Somebody said it's, the, it's, it's a spoken word from God. This is what we're taught, yes? It's a spoken word from God. It's not, but that's not, that's what we're taught, but that's not all it is, and we're often done a disservice. What, we understand that it is an utterance, right? That which, that, that which is or, or has been uttered by the living voice or, or things spoken or a word. And so what is often taught in the church is that there's the logos and there's the rhema. And this is only attributed to God. The truth of the matter is God does give rhema. Y'all know this ain't deep. That means y'all can't give me an excuse afterwards that y'all was just taking notes. 
And that's why y'all was quiet, because y'all was learning. <laughs> God gives rain. When Matthew 4 says, but he answered and said, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every rhema, or every word, that proceeds out of the mouth of God. God gives rhema. But get this, you give rhema. This is why the Bible tells you to watch your mouth. <laughs> Because you give rhema. Matthew 12, 36 says, But I say unto you that every idle rhema that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. That the utterance that you speak, watch, is your enemy gives rhema. Matthew 5, 11 says, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. The word say is rhema. When men rhema all manner of evil against you. When they utter a spoken word from the living voice in all manners of evil against you. Church gives rhema. Right? Matthew 16, 18 says, But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every rhema may be established. That's why we come together, because when two or three touch and agree, there he is. And then whatever he speaks, we come together in the hearing of that word so that it may be established. Because every truth is established with two or three witnesses. So the real question when we get to breaking this down is whose rhema are we walking under? Is, is are we walking under what mama said about us? Are we walking under what the world says about us? Are we, are we walking under what our education says about us? Uh, Mark 9 says, uh, in verse 32, it says, but they understood not the rhema or that saying and were afraid to ask him. Jesus was releasing the word and the people around him didn't even understand the word, but would not ask him. So that means they was not walking under what he was releasing. You cannot walk under what you don't understand. You cannot walk under a word that you have not received, that you have no revelation of. You just walk in. But the Bible tells us that in Mark 14, that the moment that Peter denied Jesus for the third time, that he remembered the rhema that Jesus had spoken. So, so the thing is, whose rhema are you walking under? Now, this is important because of this. I want you to get this. I'm going to reread these scriptures to you, okay? These are the ones that, that I read earlier. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away, from, gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this rhema which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the rhema, which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherd. But Mary kept all these rhema and pondered them in her heart. When we read this uh, just regularly, it says she kept all these things. Um, they made known abroad the saying, or they went to see this thing that they were told. But this is all rhema. This is all manifestation of a spoken word from God. Says, uh, and she pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, and it was told unto, as it was told unto them. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he up, uh, took, then he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy rhema. Wow. Whose rhema are we walking under? Because these men got a word from God. 
And then they went to see the manifestation of that word. And then they took that word and began to declare it. And then there was another man in the temple that waited there for years because he had a word from God that he would not die until he saw the Christ. Not leaving this temple until I see the Christ. I know all males got to be born and brought in here and dedicated, so I'm going to be in here until I see the Christ. And he, while he waited, he, he had the Holy Ghost upon him that led him in to make sure he did not miss the word that was established, that there was a word. And so, let me get some keys because we're going to get up out of here. Be quick about it. Where you at? Yeah, 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 yeah. Run, run with it. Run with it. There's a word that's going out. Come on. Come on. The name Simeon means hearkening. It means hearkening. Um, it comes from the word Peter or Simon, which means piece of the rock, which the root word in Hebrew uh, for Simon means heard. Because what God made known in the earth is the word that was with him in the beginning. That, that, he, that he sends this word. This word comes in through a process that says purity matters. We're not mixing. I'm coming. Jesus said, I come uh, to divide. I bring a sword. I come to divide mother against daughter, father against son. He, he don't come to make fellowship with the darkness. The light shined in the darkness, and the darkness uh, uh, comprehended him not. So Simeon's waiting for a word. His name means heard. He heard what? He heard, he heard a rhema. Here's, the, here's where he missed it. Or maybe it just was God's timing for him. He says that he was waiting on the consolation of Israel. The word there, consolation, is, uh, and I'm not Greek by any mean, but the word is uh, paraklesis. So while he was waiting on the consolation of Israel, the world was waiting on the consoler or the intercessor, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, the comforter. When Jesus said, I'll send another a comforter, and that word in Greek is parakletos. Simeon was just waiting to see the result, which is the comforting. But the people of God were waiting for the actual comforter. I'm not in this thing with God to get what he has to give. I'm in this thing with God because I want God. I don't want the result of God. I want the relationship with God. I don't want, I don't want the promise of God if it's not attached to, to, to the active moving mouth and hand of God. And, 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 and so he, he's sitting there and he's waiting on the, the paraclesis when he should be waiting on the paracletos. And the, the Bible says she brings in two doves. Now watch this. Um, there was no reason, like I said, for her to bring this in. So why then would the, would the Holy Spirit lead her into following this process? I say that the two doves were not sin offerings for her, but announcements. The announcement is you only got two steps left. You're only two steps away. Uh, the way Jesus shows us the pattern is, not even needing to, he goes to be baptized and a dove descends. He ascends to heaven and the Holy Spirit descends upon the people. Uh, that there's the cross, which, was, which, which is a baptism in a sense for him. He did two baptisms, be born of water and be born of spirit, right? He went through this water and came up. But then he went through the cross, and when he came back up, there was a different dissension that fell upon the people. And, 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 and whoever has a hard time with that, understand what we teach about baptism and understand ritually is that the old man dies and is buried. And that the new man resurrects and rises in power. So, so we get that from the cross, not the River Jordan. So to those who are waiting for consolation in God, those who are waiting for, for a consoler, those who are waiting for, for things that are broken to be fixed in their life, here's, here's what God has to tell you. He's provided two steps. 
You're just two steps away. There's the cross and then the filling of the Holy Spirit. There's salvation and then the indwelling of God. So she sends this as an offering. I love how the Bible says that when this was said, many wondered. Not wondered like I wonder, but wandered like, like it, he's a wonder. Many wondered, but Mary kept it inside and pondered in her heart. You know, sometimes you got to keep it until you have had your time to wrestle with it. Sometimes you got to hold a thing in until you have had your time to consult with God and say, God, what do these things mean? How come I heard one thing and feel another? How come you promised me a king, but I only can afford two turtle doves? How come you said he'd be a savior, but there's a threat on his life? How come you said he would rule, but we're hiding from Herod? I, you got to ponder these things. And too many of us have, have, have uh, the advice of too many people who enjoy the show. Those who like to wonder, those who like the drama, those who like to watch something unfold. How are you seeking what's pleasing uh, to the eyes and then think you got a right to speak into my ear? No, 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 I ain't taking no advice from Eve after she stared at that fruit too long. Uh, you too busy liking what you see to speak to the thing that brings me faith. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by a word. And I'm not walking under the rhema of something that's going to take my faith. I'm going to walk under the word of something that's going to build my faith. So you like to show. You like to watch. You like to be amazed. But I'm struggling with something on the inside. And I can't release that to you because you might talk me out of where God wants to go. That's why the Bible says, above all these things, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. That's why the Bible says for us to write the word on our heart that we might not sin against it. See, Mary pondered with the rhema. She struggled with it inside her heart. She thought about it. But I'll tell you one thing, when she figured it out, she didn't sin against it because it was written where she kept it at. The Bible says that the heart overflows. The heart overflows. She was prophesied by Simeon that a sword would pierce her soul. A sword will pierce your own soul and that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. It's funny scripture says that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword that is able to, to divide even soul from spirit, piercing even to divide soul from spirit. The first person to live this scripture out is Mary. That a, soul, a sword will pierce her own soul and the hearts of many will be revealed because the word separates joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So that word pierced her soul. That word dealt with her thoughts and intents and the things that she kept in her heart. But thank God there was a rhema she was under. Because I don't know many mothers that could walk under that type of word. I don't know many brothers that could walk under that type of word. I don't know many good friends that could walk under that type of word. But when you walk under that type of word, it don't matter how you've seen a thing grow. When God wants to take it, you don't mind letting it go. When God wants to change it, you don't mind shifting with it. You don't mind changing roles or titles when you walk under that type of word. So when you sit at the foot of the cross and Jesus says, son, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. You don't say, I've always done it like this. This is what I'm used to. This is what I thought the promise made. You said, God, if you speak it, man don't live by bread alone, but by every rhema that continually proceeds out of the mouth of God and while it may not be costing to me I'll make the sacrifice while I may not owe it I'll pay it I want to be as close to your word as possible I don't want to follow you from a distance so let me keep my heart pure Lord let the meditations of my heart let the work of my hands be acceptable in your sight the words of my mouth the words of my mouth Somebody just needs to remember the word that was spoken. Somebody needs to silence the voices. We are in the age of the liar. He talks constantly. He talks from your palm. He talks from your wall. 
talks from your car talks from your kids talks from your earbuds we got to change the word we walk under this is not we don't celebrate the spirit of Christmas we celebrate the spirit of the living God it's not about our gifts he was the gift he gives the gift of eternal life it's only two steps away I don't wake up and run to see what I can get. A wise man will run to him to see what he can give to him. Because that word is more valuable. Wisdom is more valuable than ruby and gold. And they have taught us to seek after silver and gold and not to seek after a word. This whole holiday is about silver and gold. No, this is about a word. A word that was released. And that word was glory to God in the highest, in the holy of holies, in the third heavens, for they are his throne and on earth, which is his footstool, peace, peace and goodwill towards men. There is a promise that we're walking into if we're walking under that word. Father God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your promise. We thank you that, that, that you don't change your mind about us, that you're not a man that you should lie or the son of man that you should repent, but that what you have spoken, that all of your promises are yes and amen. So God, we walk under your word. We silence the voice of every liar and every enemy. We silence every deceiving tongue in Jesus' name. Father, we rebuke every word that comes that's not, that's a, that does not come from you. We ask you to cover our ears, give us the sermon and that manner confuse those tongues mix those tongues in Jesus name but father we ask you to build our faith on your word that we will walk by that faith into your promises and not on sight based on the lies that are around us in Jesus mighty name somebody shout amen, amen. I'm gonna tell y'all what how they say it, y'all slow, but y'all worth waiting on. Y'all woke up eventually, that coffee must have kicked in on you. <laughs> well, I should have had Manny up here the whole time. Spencer, Jeff, y'all should have been up here. Hold on, let me see. That's right. I didn't know I, I bring that bass. <laughs> if it wasn't a cage, I'd have hit the drum too, bro. But you, you over there in that COVID cage, boy. I don't know. <laughs> you got a stage mask on. <laughs> when you came in, you received an envelope. That envelope says tithe and offering. It says tithe and offering. Today it should say two turtle doves, huh? Or maybe a dove and a lamb. I don't know where yet. It says tithe, tithe or offering. We, we understand our tithe is our covenant. It is our covenant. And our offering is our sacrifice. We're thankful for what Jesus has done. That's why giving is worship, because it's obedience and a sacrifice. Um, and we're thankful for what Jesus has done and taken our place that we don't, that our lives have been redeemed by him. Uh, we don't have to pay the, the temple shekels, you know, <laughs> to keep them because he paid that price. But we should display our worship for him in our giving because he is the bigger giver. There's also digital ways you can give uh, online, cash app and text to give in the app. So if you do that digitally, make sure you don't lose the reverence of worship. It's easy to get on your phone, see a notification, reply to a text message, check an email, uh, see who calls you miss. Don't get pulled out of worship because that's what this is. This is not protocol, this is worship. Father God, we thank you for the privilege to give to your kingdom. Everything we have is from you. Father, we release uh, our offering back to you. We commit our tithe to you. We ask you to take it and to bless it. Do more with it than is humanly possible. God, stretch it like you did the fish and the loaves. And I pray a blessing on your people, Father, that you would open up the windows of heaven according to your word and pour out a blessing there wouldn't be room enough to receive. Father, I pray that you meet the needs of their household. I pray, Lord, that you meet the needs of their family, that you meet the needs of their health, of their budget. Father, that, that they lack nothing, that they be missing nothing but that they be made whole because they put their faith in you and they trusted in you and not their own wealth. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.